God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open and all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please sing together, our God. Oh, 
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli whose sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in the room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called out, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears and anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what is it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 139 responsibly by half verse. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places. And there are with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. But you, O Lord, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before. And upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. For you yourself created my innermost parts. 
I will thank you because I am marvelous, marvelously made. My body was not hidden from you. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. All things are law lawful for, for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Please stand and sing together. He knows my name.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found a him about whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is a truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. <clears throat> Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. As the choir gets seated, those of you that have come to the other services, and I don't do it on this night for some reason, I don't know, I say a prayer before I preach. And the prayer goes like this. It said, uh, Father, make us the masters of ourselves. And we would like that, wouldn't we? We want... God to help us learn to be the masters of ourselves and the way that we start that process is to understand who we are, right? And uh, take our minds and think with them. We want to kind of get into the mind of God, don't we? I mean, that would be a good thing to do. Take our, eye, our lips and speak through them. So, lo lots of times in our life we've said things we regretted later, right? And we hope that our words will be guided by God's word. And then take our hearts and set them on fire through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> That's a great thing to have as well. We want our hearts set on fire. And I say that prayer not just because it's a beautiful prayer and a way to open my preaching, but I say it because of the priest mentor that I had who was highly responsible for me going into the priesthood. Taylor Wingo was his name, and he died at 49 years old. And every Sunday he would get up and he'd preach and he'd say those words. And Taylor was a good preacher. I, every time he preached, I was locked into his words. And a spark in him touched a spark in me. And then as I got to know him, I discovered he was a real man's man. I learned this because he played on the basketball team, and... He got kicked out of two games for uh, getting technical fouls for arguing with the referees. And then he quit the team. And he said, I said, Taylor, why are you quitting the team? He said, I'm afraid I'm going to throw away my Christian witness if I keep playing. And uh, he played on the softball team with us. And he was just one of those people that men were drawn to. And I, that spark within him touched a spark within me. And then I discovered that he was a former Marine a lieutenant, fought in Vietnam. And, and I, I wanted to be a Marine. When I was in college, I couldn't. And that spark in him touched a spark within me. And then he was an engineer before he went into the seminary. And, and I'd always wanted to be an engineer. And that spark within him touched a spark within me. So I say that prayer in honor of him every Sunday, because I want to know who I am. And he helped me to discover parts of me that I knew were real. We are always looking to know who we are. And early on in our lives, we 
have this element that comes into our life that clouds that. When I was going on this journeys that I went on this week, I went down to Birmingham to be with the clergy. Always a difficult assignment because the clergy are judging one another. They don't mean to, but they are. They're measuring each other to see if they measure up or somebody else measures down. There's a lot of posing that goes on to let people know I'm better than they are. And I don't like any of that. My tolerance level for that is very low. And, and it disturbs me because I'm trying to discover who I am, not who I am as designated by someone else. Right? Nathaniel was like that. He was a man with no guile, Jesus said. He, his tolerance level for that kind of stuff, we, we might call it BS, right? It was real low. I mean, he was honestly trying to discover who he was. And he didn't need all that interference, that stuff that gets in the way. And he was looking for the truth. I also went on a trip to see my aunt after the clergy gathering. She's going to be 100 in July. She's the widow of my favorite Uncle Harrison, you know my Uncle Harrison. You knew my Uncle Harrison. He worked for him. Uh, he was the Episcopal connection, the only Episcopalian in the family against a whole lot of people from the church that I grew up in. And I loved him, and he loved me. And I really loved his widow. They were only married for eight years. They got married in their 70s. And... Uh, she was not a real educated woman, my Aunt Eva. She had always worked hard and supported her family as a single mother. But she didn't have a judgmental bone in her body, doesn't have a judgmental bone in her body today, and always glad to, to see me, even though she can't see. And she can barely hear. I had to tell her four times who it was before finally she recognized what I was saying, and the first words out of her mouth is, how is Trudy? So I knew I was not first on her line of people. And then later in the week, uh, yesterday, we were with my Uncle Clyde, who turned 90, and, and we were in Thomasville, Georgia. Long drive, and... All of the people there, for the most part, was, were members of the church there, of the church of my youth. So I wasn't really looking forward to that because there was a lot of judgment in that church as I was growing up. My uncle was my Sunday school teacher, and he was always kind of looking at me as if I needed some special training because my father was not a member of that church. And he thought he needed to kind of press a little harder because I didn't have good upbringing. And I was his special case because my brother just basically rejected any kind of training from anybody. And so we had a good relationship, but he was always telling me things like, you couldn't wear shorts in public. I, around women, they might see me, and because I was so strikingly handsome, they would be drawn to me more. And... and uh, and then, of course, no swimming in the same pool as them or dancing because that might also excite the passions. And other things as well. And, and I began to see that some of those things as that clutter that gets in the way of discovering who we are. And when I found myself drawn away from that configuration of Christendom, I began to unclutter a little bit until I found this part of Christendom, where I felt free, and I felt like I could really discover who I was. And one of my cousins, my oldest cousin, was at this party yesterday. She's 70-something and lives in Boaz. And one time she made the trek down here, and I met her at Greenbrier. And she had all these pictures she was showing me, and they were all pictures that I'd, I had myself of us as young people 
And I remembered her as this bright and shining college student. That was the last time I'd seen her. And now she's in the country living with a man that she met over at this church chat line. And uh, she stops in midstream. He's just sitting there watching. And she says, how could you have left the church? And I looked at her and I thought, what? I'm a priest. Do you not know what I do for a living? I gave up my life for this. What are you talking about? And so we hadn't seen each other until yesterday. She was awfully sweet. And most of the people were as well. After all, it was a birthday party. Who am I in all the clutter? Nathaniel was looking for who he was. He wanted to know who I am. And he spent his days doing that. He was a good Jewish young man. And a good Jewish young man went to the synagogue and read his scripture. And he knew about the Messiah, would have. Everyone would have if they were studying. And he knew that Messiah was to come and he had all the reasons and what they were. The, the, the counselor, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the light of the world. And John had just said in this scripture before this piece, that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. The Word, the Word of God that was there at the beginning, through whom all things came to be. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that was what Nathaniel was looking for. And he was sitting alone underneath a fig tree, which was a place for meditation and contemplation where you, one who was dealing with a lot of clutter would unclutter themselves to try to discover who they were. And then Jesus was walking, talking, and meeting, and he'd called Peter and Andrew, and they had told their friend about <clears throat> Jesus. And Philip got turned on, and he went to Nathaniel, and he said, uh, we found the one, the one who Moses and the law talked about, and all the prophets, uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And, and now here's Nathaniel, here's his low tolerance level. He said, nothing good can come out of Nazareth, can it? Now we, we do that. We may not know we do it. I mean, we think of ourselves as good people. We're not prejudiced, are we? Never. And tomorrow we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s day. Any of y'all think that's a good day or a bad day, right? Don't you don't have to answer, but some people think it's really a swell day, right, to celebrate this great man. Other people think of it as a kind of a, a day that uh, we ought not to celebrate. When I was growing up, we heard a lot of things about Martin Luther King Jr. I, I lived in a neighborhood where... My, three blocks from me was railroad tracks. And my mother always told me, don't go over the other side of the tracks. Because we knew why. Because those people lived over there, right? Those dark people. And we don't want to go over there. That was the same in Nathaniel's day. Uh, he would have heard about Nazareth, a little bitty town, you know, kind of like uh, Hartzell, you know. You don't want to go there. Right? And, and how, what good could come out of Hartzell, right? Maybe Kimberly. But she made it out. Yeah. Or Athens, you know, somebody from Athens. Florence, you know. Well, nothing good comes out of Florence. Yeah. And, and that's the way Nathaniel was raised to believe that. And, and we develop those prejudices and they become clutter in the way, right? We, I used to hear Martin Luther King was a communist or an outside agitator both of which were bad. I said, today, today I guess you would plug liberal on him. You know, he's a liberal, you know. And of course, nothing good can come from a liberal, right? And so that was the way that we saw him. And yet, for many, he was a liberator. He was the Messiah, in fact, for many people. Many people believe their lives are better because of him and he sparked a spark within them. 
so that they might see a little bit more light. Nathaniel was looking for light. And when he met Jesus and heard the words that Jesus said, he said, you are the Son of God. I know it. I don't give up all that other stuff. Nothing else compares to you. As I thought about all this this week and all my relatives and little Peyton, Peyton is four years old, and um, today, if you say something to her, she does something wrong, Zach will tell you this, she does something she knows she shouldn't do, and she gets caught, or says something she shouldn't say and gets caught, she starts crying immediately. Whoever catches her, right? And she starts crying, and then she'll curl up like this with her head down, and, and we know what that is, right? That's shame. That's shame. And that shame starts at four years old, or maybe earlier, right? And she wants somebody to hold her. We're like that. We have these things that get in the way, things that we're just sure of, you know, that things are a certain way. People are a certain way if they're from Hartzell, yeah, or Florence, you know. And, and then we've decided that's the way they are, you know, and then something will happen, something will break through, and we'll find out it isn't that way, and shame breaks in, right? Now, sometimes we'll justify ourselves for somehow, but if that shame breaks in, then we just kind of curl up, and, and it affects the way we see ourselves, and that's what the effects of the clergy uh, looking at each other and judging does. You know, if we buy into that, we think of ourselves in their terms, Right? Nathaniel wasn't into that. He wasn't going to buy into that. And we shouldn't either. As I thought about all this this weekend, I thought about someone. Uh, it was because of his words that had kind of gotten into my system. But just the facts, ma'am, nothing but the facts. Y'all remember those words? Any of y'all remember those words? We believe that they were said by uh, Joe Friday played by Jack Webb and Dragnet, you know, just the facts, ma'am, nothing but the facts. And I, I thought about that because I thought that's what Nathaniel was looking for, just the facts. And so I looked it up and, and I checked it out on Snopes. Y'all know Snopes? I checked it out and somebody had just told me last week Snopes is no good, it, it's flawed, right? I thought, well, how could that be? Maybe, maybe I should go to Wikipedia, right? Because it's not flawed, right? Anybody can change Wikipedia, right? And Snopes said he didn't say those words. He never said them. And, and went through this long explanation and told how he, that wasn't what he said. So I went and looked at trailers and stuff and never saw any point where he said that. What he would say, he would say, I'm Friday and I carry a badge. And that meant something back then. It, the show Dragnet started in the late 1950s and it was uh, immediately a big hit. Everybody loved it, especially police officers, for its accuracy. He was even made an honorary policeman for the Los Angeles PD, and he was given full uh, burial, police burial, when he died, even though he never served as a policeman. And what he would say is, that, I'm Friday, I carry a badge, and that meant something, respect. There was someone here that was looking for the truth. And he's, what he would say is, now, we're going to ask you some questions, and what we want is the facts, right? Not just the facts, ma'am. Although he was awfully polite. And if you ever watched this show, any of y'all haven't seen Dragnet? I know some of you young people haven't. They had a remake of Dragnet in the movie with Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. And... and and in Dragnet, if you ever see it, they have old trailers of it. Everybody's smoking in it. Everybody. Everybody smokes cigarettes in, in uh, Dragnet. A particular brand of cigarettes. You know why? They were the sponsor. They were the lead sponsor. And they were Chest Chesterfields. And, 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 and Jack Webb is a chain smoker in the, in the show. You think cigarettes are good for you? That's, that's what they were telling us. You need to buy our product. They would do it on the show. They'd do it in the, between the commercials. 
These are good for you. You should smoke them every day, Grace. Every day. Get you a pack tonight. You believe that? Anybody believe they're good for you? Price, you, you're going to start smoking after this sermon? They aren't good for you, are they? We know they're not. They can make you sick, really sick. They can cause all sorts of problems, cancer, heart disease. You know when Jack Webb died, how old he was? 62 years old of a heart attack. So what's the truth? We hear all things. We, we hear why we should be a Democrat or why we should be a Republican or why we should work for a certain company or not work for a certain company, why we should not go over to the Hartzell place or, or Florence. We hear who you should associate with and who you shouldn't. We hear what you should buy to brush your teeth so that you can be attracted to all those girls while you're wearing long pants so you don't want to attract yourself to them. And we hear all that stuff and we're looking for the truth. Where is it? Where are we going to find it? Don't go to Nazareth. I went through the 60s. I, I remember some of it. And I remember... Uh, I remember when they bombed those little girls in the church, and I hated it. I thought, you know, I, I learned in Sunday school that wasn't good for you. In that same Sunday school class where I was taught all this negative stuff. And then I remember the day they sick the dogs on it, Bull Connor, and the, blew the hoses, the fire hoses on the young kids, and how I hated that. Because I knew I'd learned in Sunday school not to do Stuff like that. Turn the other cheek was the word that I was taught. And yet here we were. We were doing something just the opposite of that. I remember that. And, I, and it shaped who I was. It didn't spark something inside of me. It repelled something inside of me. And then I thought that was all over with. I'd graduated from high school. I, I had uh, seen some great changes. And laws were passed. And then in 1968, the year after I graduated high school, the this young black couple with a couple of kids bought a house in my neighborhood. It was a little far, further up where the richer people lived, where you grew up in that neighborhood. And, and, and two blocks from Bull Connor's house, this house was bought. It was a nice house in a nice neighborhood, so these people had enough resources to buy a house in that neighborhood. They were good, educated people. Before they could move in, somebody spray painted graffiti all over their house with horrible things on it. We don't need your type here. Go back across the railroad tracks. I thought all that was over with. Jesus came and said, come and see, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. We got a lot of words being thrown at us all the time. This is what to do, this is what to do, this is what not to do. What are we going to believe? How are we going to find the truth, right? Well, John tells us the word became flesh. Not any word, the word. This is it. This is the word. All those other words are extension of that word. Some are good, some are not so good. I had this vestry member, David. I, I went, I'm going to retreat Friday with the vestry, and I do this every year. Uh, I won't miss it when I retire. I've often had someone that was uh, going to be a troublemaker on the vestry, and they tend to show up with their own agenda, sometimes hidden, sometimes pre prepared in advance. And I try to dissuade that and so I would send a letter out to the vestry and I'd say now here's the deal don't come with any agenda don't have any preset agenda come and let's listen to God's word and, and find the truth through our time together and David was a smart man he had a PhD in education and a masters of divinity same as me he was my neighbor and I played golf with him so I thought he was my friend and I was okay about him being on the vestry until he showed up on Friday with a five-page agenda with details, bullet points, of what we needed to do to make the church better. 
Now, did he not listen? What was getting in the way? Right? I told the church this morning, I said, you know, some of you aren't listening right now because you've already made up your mind. You know what's right. You know exactly what the truth is, so you don't need it. And you're not a sinner. Well, if you're not a sinner, why are you here? You don't need Jesus. You don't need us, right? So don't, don't waste your time. Go fishing. Play backgammon, as David Hume said. You know, the, this is a place for sinners. That's what Jesus invited to him, sinners. And David didn't understand himself as a sinner. And this is the reason why we do things like this, because we have what I've told you before, epistemological presuppositions. Do you all remember me telling you? Some of you do. An epistemological presupposition is this. Epistemology is a study of how we know what we know. Now, it could be from your Sunday school teachers, my Uncle Clyde. It could be from a teacher or your parents. Or it could be from the environment you grow up in. But you learn, and you learn who you are in, through all of that, right? And you develop presuppositions about the way things are. And the only way that's going to get shattered is something happens to shatter in your life. Some event. Maybe you get a terminal illness. Maybe you lose your job. Maybe uh, one of your children goes astray. Maybe a breakup of a relationship. And you begin to think, well, who I am it wasn't really who I thought I was. Right? And where do you go for the truth? Well, I'm going to tell you, my uncle, as bad a judge he was of my life throughout the years, has grown old. He and my Aunt Eva both can't see, and they, they neither can hear very good. And I noticed something yesterday. My uncle is a lot softer than he used to be, and he loves me a lot more for just who I am. He treats me like a son, because he had no boys. He just had one girl. And I was the closest boy to him. And he listens to me. And he wants to know about my life. He wants to know about my preaching. I told him to check me out on YouTube. <laughs> and he did. Something happened to him. Because his life has changed. His wife died. He's no longer a physical fit person. And he's beginning to look for who he is in the right place. in that word made flesh. And we can do that. And the way that happens is through each other. Through looking at that spark in someone else who connects with that spark within us. And we know that's real. And all those epistemological presuppositions just go out of the way. And this is what I want you to do. This is a... This is a Biblical imperative for tonight, and I want you to take it home with you. I know this is a long sermon, but I think it's pretty good. The idea is that you wake up tomorrow, and I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Lord, thank you for another day. Make me a little bit better today than I was yesterday. Help me be a little bit less prejudiced. Help me be open to those people that I don't agree with and find a spark within someone that matches with a spark within me. And if you do that, I believe you're going to find a piece of the kingdom of heaven. And that's good news. Let's stand and say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of
Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked, faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. That we have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace. I really expect Welcome, good, good to see all of you. We don't have many announcements. We have a few things going on that you need to pay attention to. If you're uh, into uh, cont the contemplative life, we have a new offering on the 15th. This starting at, uh, it'll be in the associate, former associate's office. It's a contemplative prayer group. And you'll want to be there if you're into that sort of thing. Notice the other announcements as well. Due to the vestry retreat, I won't be here next Sunday. Father Sam will be. Please pray for your vestry that we might get a clear vision for our future. Notice the other announcements as well. Next Sunday, soup and salad. And so you'll, you might want to bring some. Bring some soup and salad. Enough that if somebody shows up for the streets, that needs, that's hungry, that we'll have enough for them. And ascribe to the Lord the honor to do his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
Things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God for the goodness and love which you have made to, known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people in your words spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh Jesus your son for in these last days you sent him to be incarnate for the Virgin Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world and you have, in him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you in him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. We offer this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with St. Matthew and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, For you, the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
your life the greatest God, Heavenly Father, you've graciously accepted us as living members. All our, our ideas be your constant companion. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Marvelous light. Into marvelous light I'm riding Out of darkness, out of shame Through the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way I once was fatherless a stranger with no hope Your kindness waken me Waken me from my sleep now Your love it beckons deeply A call to come and die By grace now I will come Take this life, take your life Sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting, from the grave you've risen, victoriously, into marvelous light I'm running, out of darkness, out of shame, through the cross you are the truth, you Thank you. 
Hallelujah, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Into my